The roll call to establish a quorum. Let's start from my right hand side. Albert Wong, professional member. Maria Serpa, professional member. Debbie Vio, professional licensee member. Greg Lippe, public member. Uh, Victor Law, profession, professional licensee. Stan Weiser, professional registered pharmacist. Levanza Butler, professional member. Ricardo Sanchez, public member. Okay, and uh, quorum has been established. Then we'll go into the, the agenda item number two, which is closed session. All right, so I think the public will need to be excused because we go into the closed session. Good evening, everyone. The, the board is back in session. Uh, we need to do the, uh, another roll call to establish the quorum. Let's start from my right hand side. Albert Wong, professional member. Maria Serpa, professional member. Debbie Veal, professional member. Greg Lippi, public member. Victor Law, I'm the president. I'm also a professional member. Stan Weiser, professional member. Levanza Butler, professional member. Ricardo Sanchez, public member. And a uh, quorum has been established. Uh, we have here Your Honor Corin Wong. Okay, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I believe the first petition hearing, um, well, actually, before we start with the petition hearings, I'll, I'll just kind of describe um, the process uh, we'll go through. Is so I'll call the matter and then. Um, Mr. Steinheimer, on behalf of the, um, the Attorney General's Office, will give a general overview of uh, the prior discipline uh, for background. And then after that, I'll turn it over to the petitioner to provide uh, any evidence the petitioner wishes to provide um, after the, uh, and, and testify. After the petitioner testifies, Mr. Steinheimer will have the opportunity to ask questions um, and then we kind of do a back and forth um, until everybody's uh, testified, either asked their questions or testified about what they want. The board will also have a chance to um, ask questions. And then um, once we're done with evidence, then if the parties want to give um, summary closing statements, I'll allow that. Uh, once um, we are done with closing s statements, then the matter will be um, submitted and the board will re adjourn um, after both matters into closed session to decide the matter uh, so that no decision will be issued um, today but at a later date. Uh, so with that, um, I'll call the first matter which is in the uh, matter of the petition of Jane Oyama, O-Y-A-M-A. -A. It's OAH number 2019-030-373 and I should say we are on the record uh, before the California State Board of Pharmacy. My name is Corin Wong. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, and um, Mr. President had established a quorum already, um, but I also will state officially for, for the record that a, a quorum has been established. Uh, Mr. Steinheimer, if you would state your appearance for the record, please. Uh, good morning. Okay, and ma'am, are you Jane Oyama? Yes, I am. Okay, Ms. Oyama, and I noticed you have someone with you, sir, if you would state your appearance for the record. I certainly will, Your Honor. My name is Steve Zygan. I'm the attorney representing Ms. Oyama in our petition. Okay, very good. And sir, just for the record, if you would spell your last name, please. Z-E-I-G-E-N. Okay, very good. Uh, Mr. Steinheimer, if you would like to begin with your summary. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, first, I provided Your Honor with uh, the original petition uh, for early termination uh, and the packet. Um, the board has also been provided a copy of this. I'd like to have that as marked as Exhibit 1, and I offer it into evidence at this time. Uh, let me go over what the petition packet consists of. Uh, first, it's the petition for early termination of probation, dated September 3rd, 2018. It also consists of petitioner's supporting documentation, which generally consists of the following. A narrative statement from petitioner, 
a DUI explanation, evidence of petitioner's attendance at AA meetings, a certificate demonstrating completion of the pharmacy ethics course, uh, Maximus drug testing records, evidence of compliance with the drinking driving program, including 12 hours of education, two individual sessions, and three self-help meetings, 12 letters of support from her employer, family, friends, and colleagues, and continuing pharmacy education credits. Exhibit 1 also contains a certified copy of the decision and order in Board of Pharmacy case number 5381, which was effective June 6, 2016. So I'd like that to be admitted into evidence at this time. Okay, uh, the petition and supporting documents will be marked collectively as Exhibit 1 for identification. Uh, Mr. Zeigen, any objection to one for all purposes? No, Your Honor. And one is so admitted. Uh, and now I'd like to provide a brief summary of uh, petitioner's license history with the board. Uh, petitioner's license number is 49169. The license was first issued on January 17, 1997. On April 3, 2015, an accusation was filed against petitioner in case number 5381. The accusation alleged that petitioner was subject to discipline based on a criminal conviction in 2013 for public intoxication and a criminal conviction in 2014 for alcohol-related reckless driving. Additionally, the accusation alleged that petitioner was subject to discipline for failing to disclose her February 2013 conviction when she renewed her pharmacist license in March of 2013. Petitioner had marked no in response to the question of whether she had been convicted of any crime. Petitioner and the board agreed to a stipulated settlement effective June 6, 2016. Pursuant to the stipulated settlement, petitioner's license was revoked, but the revocation was stayed and petitioner was placed on probation for a period of five years with terms and conditions one through 24. Petitioner's probation term began on June 6, 2016. However, her probation was told from January 6, 2017 until February 27, 2017, uh, bringing her new probation completion date to July 27, 2021. Petitioner was also required to reimburse the board for costs of investigation and prosecution in the amount of $1,857.50. Petitioner has paid these costs in full. Petitioner is now requesting the board terminate her probation early. Uh, and, and so now I'll turn it over to you, Your Honor. All right, thank you, Mr. Steinheimer. Um, Mr. Zekin, do you wish to um, provide a summary opening statement um, before providing testimony? I do, Your Honor, okay. and, and it is Zeigen. Zeigen, I'm, I'm sorry. I was talking about that with Mr. Steinheimer before, before the hearing. It's always the second vowel that gets pronounced. Um, if I might, Your Honor, uh, panel members, Ms. Oyama comes before you today seeking to terminate the five-year probation which was stipulated to on March 29, 2016, and which became effective June 6th of 2016. The most significant date for this panel, however, is December 30, 2013. Why do I say that? Because she has not had a drink since 2013. December 30, 2013 was the day of reckoning for Ms. Oyama when she said, you know what, I got a problem, I'm gonna stop. Now the stipulation was granted and signed two and a half years later, but as she sits before you today, she's been sober for five years and four months. During this time, she has fully complied with all of the terms of probation, both those stemming from her July 30, 2014 DUI conviction and the various terms from the stipulation she entered into with the board which imposed the five years probation as well as a 10 day suspension. In the board's guidelines for petitions for early termination, it is noted the board will consider whether there was actual or potential harm to the public, patients or others. While there was certainly the potential for harm to others, there was none. There was no harm, there was harm only to Ms. Oyama and her family. There was never any suggestion of any harm to any patient, ever. One of the other factors listed in the, the guidelines pr provided by the board is the length of time since the violations were committed. As noted, Ms. Oyama's DUI occurred on the last night of December 
December 30th, 2013, five years and four months ago. Another factor mentioned in the guidelines is the petitioner's attitude towards her commission of the original violation and her attitude towards compliance with the probation, with the legal sanctions involved, and with her own rehabilitative efforts. In both of these aspects, Ms. Oyama has been superlative. She took full ownership of her alcohol problem early on. She made no excuses. She pointed no fingers elsewhere. The petition we filed on her behalf is replete with the rehabilitative efforts that she's undertaken, all of which relate to these violations. As Mr. <laughs> Steinheimer indicated, there are attendance sheets from the hundreds and hundreds of AA meetings that she has attended since 2015, which I might point out is significantly prior to the actual effective date of the stipulation. Included in that section of the petition are the sheets <coughs> evidencing, evidencing her attendance at the Kaiser Chemical Dependency Recovery Program as well. And there's also a July 31, 2015 letter from a Dr. Geis, G-E-I-S-S-E, -S -E, of Kaiser's Addiction Medicine Department, in which he says almost four years ago, and I'm quoting now, Ms. Oyama remains solid in her sobriety and expresses motivation to remain involved in treatment, close quotes. Ms. Oyama has continued to fulfill that promise. The petition also contains hundreds of negative drug tests administered as part of the Maximus program since November of 2015. The petition demonstrates Ms. Oyama successfully completed the drunk drivers program October 30, 2014. There are, as Mr. Steinheimer uh, indicated, 12 letters of support for Ms. Oyama. Some are pharmacists with whom she's worked the past few years, including the pharmacist in charge at the Las Palmas Pharmacy where she's currently employed. And she writes, and I'm quoting, I hope that soon all the conditions on her professional pharmacist license will be removed as I have full confidence in her work habits, quality of work, and good character, close quotes. Panel members, I submit to you that if the pharmacist in charge with whom Ms. Oyama has worked for the past couple of years feels that she has full confidence in her character, so should you. There is also a letter from Albert Anderson, uh, a doctor who uh, Ms. Oyama has been seeing, who has been, quote, taking care of Jane, close quotes, for two years. He too supports the petition to terminate Ms. Oyama's probation, and as in his words, she is doing spectacularly. Now, I was informed as part of the investigation that the investigator contacting the authors of the various letters was unable to get a hold of Dr. Anderson. He was out of the country on vacation. We now have his cell phone. If the board is interested in having its investigator contact Dr. Anderson, we would be happy to provide that cell phone number. The other letters, including those from people she has gotten to know in AA, paint a clear picture of someone genuinely committed to sobriety. The guidelines I referred to earlier list eight factors to be evaluated with respect to a petitioner's documented and rehabilitative efforts. Ms. Oyama checks every one of those factors which is relevant to her situation. Section E of the board's guidelines delineates six factors the board should consider when assessing a petitioner's rehabilitative and corrective efforts. Again, Ms. Oyama checks all the appropriate boxes, especially as we have seen when it comes to the third factor, the length, time, and expense associated with her efforts. The fourth factor, the opinions of qualified professionals involved in her rehabilitative efforts. The fifth factor, her reputation for truth, professional ability, and good character. And the sixth factor, her ongoing and continuing rehabilitative efforts. Panel members, Ms. Oyama has worked diligently to get to this point, and in so doing has constructed a superb petition in support of her request to terminate the probation early. As her narrative statement in the petition details, she has carried the scarlet letter of probationer all through her current employment, 
by virtue of the fact her salary is nowhere near what a pharmacist of her experience not on probation makes. Those financial considerations aside, Ms. Oyama has proven herself worthy of the board's granting of her petition through the documented hard work and compliance she has attained. I'm going to ask now Ms. Oyama to make a statement to the panel, after which, and I've spoken to Mr. Steinheimer about this, it would be my preference to ask some questions about the underlying accusation so the panel can get an understanding of the various circumstances, and thereafter the panel and Mr. Steinheimer would be free to ask questions. Is that okay with you, Your Honor? Um, I guess just the, my only uh, comment is the underlying discipline is um, not what the focus of the today's hearing is. It's it's rather the rehab rehab she's undergone. But I understand some discussion um, may be necessary to understand the re, the, the rehabilitation. So. Yeah, I, I yeah I appreciate that, Your Honor. I'll keep it short, and particularly when a factor such as the fourth or fifth cause for action uh, 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 is identified as dishonesty and fraud, I think the circumstances need to be explored just a little bit. Sure. No, I, I understand. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. I, with that, I'll give you Ms. Oyama. Okay. So, Ms. Oyama, before you start, uh, let me swear you in. So, if you could stand and raise your right hand, please. <coughs> Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you will provide in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. <coughs> Please have a seat. And if I could have you start by stating and spelling your full name for the record, please. Jane Oyama, J-A-N-E-O-Y-A-M-A. -A. Okay, Ms. Oyama, whenever you're ready. Thank you, panel members, for allowing me to present my statement. On December 30th, 2013, Sitting in jail cell for DUI all night, I was picturing how I could have possibly killed someone's child and then explained to my two daughters that I had to spend the rest of my life behind bars. This image of what could have happened got deeply ingrained in my psyche and scared me enough to keep me sober for next one year without any outside, uh, outside help. Additionally, with my two daughters' watchful eyes, I wanted to be the parent that kept the promise I won't drink again. I did not want to add any more insults to their broken hearts from their alcoholic father's multiple re relapses. That night, I conceded to myself that I am an alcoholic. Then after one year, when the board notified me of the pending investigation, I immediately took time off from work to join 14-day Kaiser Intensive Care Program. After that, I continued with their weekly after, uh, aftercare program for seven more months. This program included frequent random breathalyzer and urine drug testing. Dr. Geyser's note mentions how often I was tested. Also required was several AA meetings weekly, which I complied. All these records had been submitted. <coughs> Excuse me. As the board stipulated, I joined Maximus program on November of 2015 and completed the following requirements. One, nine months of seven days a week AA meetings, currently at four meetings a week. Two, twice weekly professional support meetings, recently approved to once a week. Average of five drug testings a month, now it's down to about four times a month. Quarterly visits with monitoring doctor, Dr. Anderson. MFI, which stands for My Family Incorporated, it's an aftercare program once a week for one, one year. Biweekly individual counseling session with a Mr. Liu, who's, who's a counselor from MFI, which um, also I did um, weekly counseling during um, the seven months I was at uh, Kaiser. I kept the same sponsor, her name's Ethel, for the last four years. She has 40 years sobriety. We've gone through the 12 steps of AA together. We have the same uh, home group, and we're in constant contact via phone and in person. Now, there are some other volunteer commitments I have uh, performed last several years. I have served as a secretary at the uh, Monday 6.30 a.m. meeting every week 
for the last three years. My two daughters are very active in cheer and mock trial in high school. I have provided food for the students and parents often needed during competitions. I also cook for various MFI activities and AA potlucks. Everyone seems to love my wontons, fried rice, and Chinese chicken salads. I was let go from Walgreens, the company I'd been with for over 12 years due to my DUI. For the next one and a half a year, actually it was um, a year and two months, that Maximus forbade me from working as a pharmacist. I worked at John's Burger part-time rather than feeling sorry for myself so I can continue providing for my family. Needless to say, the income at the burger store was not very much. So having to raise two teenage daughters, my savings were entirely depleted. But panel members, I never gave up. My older daughter is at now uh, UC Berkeley in her second year. And the younger one, I am proud to say she's a valedictorian of this year's graduating class. I've been working at this independent pharmacy for last past two years for a nominal fee. I have three hours daily commute. Despite my multiple attempts, I have not been able to find a better paying job. This is due to my probation status, which requires substantial supervision and other additional employer commitments. Expenses for Maximus alone are averages about $1,000 a month. Today, my husband and I, my husband works as a rehab counselor and is working on master's degree in mental health counseling. We are blessed to be walking together in recovery. I hope our recovery will strengthen our daughter's life journeys in positive ways and continue allowing us to mentor others. I am especially grateful for the women of AA community who provide me with love and support with life's challenges. I'll end with this last statement. I am very hopeful this panel appreciates the difficulties of this journey I forced myself to make and finds not only my words, but all the documentations provided in my petition worthy of granting my petition of early terminations. Thank you. I'm going to briefly ask uh, Ms. Oyama some of the circumstances of the underlying charges so the panel gets an understanding. Uh, Ms. Oyama, you were arrested while walking along the freeway on April 25, 2010, is that correct? Yes. And when was the conviction for that offense? That was February 1st of 2013. So almost three years after, correct? That is correct. Would you please explain to the panel members why there was almost a three-year gap between the time you were arrested and the time of the conviction? The day I was arrested, um, April 25th, 2010, which is about nine, month, nine years ago, um, I was given a ticket at the, at the police station. A month after the ticket, my mother-in-law suddenly passed away with a heart attack. She lived, uh, she lived in Hawaii. And my family, my girls and I, uh, we were um, planning to move to Hawaii that summer, but this happened, uh, so we hurried and uh, packed up everything and moved to Hawaii. This is a month after the ticket. And so um, when the, the funeral was uh, in July, and after funeral was done and everything calmed down, um, I called the court because I was given a ticket, I figured I'll just pay the fine, you know, explain. And they said um, I, there was an arrest warrant for me for not showing up at the court. So my, at the time, my girls were still little, and I could not, uh, I didn't have the full-time job yet. I could not afford the, uh, to fly back, and uh, nor could I have afforded the lawyer. So. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to. Well, let, me, let me ask a couple more questions. Did you, was there a, when did you return to California from Hawaii? So that was two years later I moved back to California and immediately I went up, uh, I went in front of the judge and he uh, fined me for 300 
and um, I paid it. I paid it that day, and I thought that was that. Everything. Okay. Was Were there any other consequences as a result of the failure to appear, and you're no. paying the fine? No, it okay. was done. Now, on December on December 30, 2013. You were arrested for a DUI, correct? Yes. Okay. And what was the date approximately when you signed, you ultimately signed the stipulation with the board? I don't have that. Okay, the stipulation with the board was not signed until 2016, correct? Correct. Okay. Um, between, did there come a point in time when you filed an application for the renewal of your pharmacy license uh, which, uh, which contained a question regarding any criminal offenses. I'm sorry, repeat that question. Did there come a time when you had to file a renewal for your pharmacy license? It was February of 2013. Okay. Did, did that application ask questions about whether you had any criminal offenses um, which had occurred to you? Cor yes. Okay, and how did you answer that question? If I remember correctly, this is going back many years. Um, the box indicated if you were uh, arrested, uh, if you were convicted of crime, mark on this box. It wasn't a yes or no question. Okay, and did you mark the box correctly? No. Why? You know, by this time, I've been um, renewing my uh, pharmac California pharmacist license almost 20 years, and I under, it was an honest mistake. I understood it as violation uh, related to my pharmacy license. Um, so, you know, since I never had to mark that, yes, I just bypassed it and I didn't mark anything. I didn't know I was doing anything wrong until I got a call from the board. When you marked that question, you, did you have any intent, intent to procure your pharmacy license by dishonesty? It was never my intent to mislead the Board of Pharmacy. Did you intend to procure your license by way of fraud? No. Did you intend to procure your license by way of misrepresentation? No. Would you characterize that as an, as an honest mistake? Yes. Okay. I don't have anything further, Your Honor. Unless you want me to make any closing comments now, or should I wait till the question's over? Why don't we wait until questioning okay. is over? Uh, Mr. Steinheimer? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Oyama, um, you're also licensed in Hawaii, is that correct? That is correct. And um, that, what's the status of that license? It is still um, cl clear. Okay. And have you ever been disciplined under that license? No. Okay. And um, have you ever worked in Hawaii as a pharmacist? Yes. And when, when did you do that? That would be the last time before I came back to California. So. When, um, I want to say, oh, about uh, 20, until sometime in 2012. Okay. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about um, your involvement with AA. Yes. Um, you, you testified that you've now been sober for uh, over, over five years. What have you, what do you, can you explain a little bit to the board what's your um, support program or your, your, um, the people who support you, how they help you maintain your sobriety at this point? Well, first of all, um, because my commute is like three hours, so hour and a half, I get up early and go to 6.30 meeting. You know, for nine months I did seven days a week. Um, so, you know, being a secretary means you go in early so I'll be there at 6 o'clock. Usually I'll go stop by at the donut store. And, and um, you go in early, and you open the, the meeting and, and get the coffee ready. And after everybody's gone, and uh, you, you know, at, at a one-hour meeting, and uh, uh, you clean up the pots and you know, close up. And I go to the, uh, I, I drive to uh, Palm Springs for work. And then uh, there's Wednesday women's meeting. Because I've been around over five, almost five years in that AA surrounding, um, you know, we're all very close. And women's meeting, um, many, many years of sobriety, 30, 40 years. And um, we talk about anything and everything. And, you know, I, I have all their phone numbers. So there's never any judgment. So you have anybody to call. It's like a whole new family. It's, 
And, and I never knew that I can have a family like this. And also, um, the AA meeting, we do uh, potlucks for every occasion, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. And so, you know, everybody get together and, and eat together, how we celebrate. Okay. So I'm very active. Okay, thank you. Um, you mentioned your, your husband was also an alcoholic. Correct. Um, are you still uh, currently married to your husband? Yes, I am. And is, what is his status with AA at this time? He, um, he goes to many uh, men's stag, and he's got like three sponsees, and plus uh, he's working at a rehab center, so uh, he's constantly you know, exposed to lots of addicts. He's been sober uh, same time as I, okay. about over five years, and you know, he's, he's very intact with okay. me. Um, if you are, uh, your, tr your probation is terminated, do you plan to continue to attend <laughs> AA meetings? Of course. And how often do you, would you plan to attend if you're not um, being required to attend AA meetings? Women's meeting, I'm going to keep going, for sure. And um, on Sundays, they have speaker meeting, which is really great. And, and I intend to uh, keep going to that and maybe a couple more morning before I go to work. Okay. And you mentioned the Maximus program. Is that the uh, pharmacist recovery program? It's um, health professionals, um, excluding MDs. Uh, everybody's, yeah, everybody shows up there. Okay, but that in terms of, uh, as one of your terms of probation, term 17 is to participate in a PRP or pharmacy recovery program, correct? Yes. And that's the Maximus program covers that, is that right? Yes. Um, do you know when that is scheduled to be completed or for you to, you know, graduate out of that? I don't have the exact time. I, oh, I know what. Uh, the date uh, I started was November, uh, hang on, 2015. And they estimate four years to five, so they don't, they don't have an exact date for you. Okay. Um, if your probation is terminated by the board um, following this hearing, would you intend to complete that program? No. Okay, and, and why wouldn't you? Um, partly, as I, I guess I haven't mentioned, um, you know, working at this pharmacy for nominal pay, and my daughter, first one is already in college, and the other one, She's, uh, she's planning to go to one of the Ivy Leagues in uh, East Coast. And financially, I don't know how I'm going to manage to have two kids. And so, you know, $1,000 a month by Maximus is a lot. And I don't really know how I'm going to manage. So, and um, what else? Uh, and they have a lot of restrictions, even travel, if you don't let them know you're going to be traveling three weeks at, in advance and get approval. My, you know, two kids in uh, universities, I can't make, it's hard to make uh, like a head arrangements to visit them, like especially if they need you, you know, urgently. And a lot of restriction, um, and also the uh, drug test and all that. It's, it's very restricting, so that's, that's my reason. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, counseling that you've underwent over the course of uh, your probation. Um, just to clarify, are you c continuing to undergo counseling, or is it just the AA meetings now that you're attending? I do see um, the board-approved uh, Dr. Dr. Anderson quarterly. Okay. And the, let me think of the counseling. I do not have an individual counseling, but, you know, women's meeting and morning AA meetings, they're, that's way better than counseling. I think. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions I have. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Oyama, is there anything further you'd like to say on your behalf? Your Honor, it's, it's, it, I think, Your Honor, it's easier for me to do the public speaking than okay. it is for Jane. Um, I have been very impressed by her. Um, I, I, 
I don't know what is out of bounds here. So, Your Honor, if I'm if I'm treading on that line, please let me know, okay. yeah. Mr. So, Stein. So, so let let me just interject. Um, if you want if you want to testify, then I need to have you sworn in. If you're just doing a closing kind of summary statement, let's um, save that until after all the questioning's done. If there, so really right now is whether Ms. Oyama wants to say anything further on her behalf or if you want to ask more questions. Oh, That's really okay. I'm looking for right now. Okay. Um, let, let, me, let me briefly follow up because I don't want an, any negative impression from Mr. Steinheimer's question regarding Maximus. Um, when, you're on, when you are part of the Maximus program, um, what are the restrictions regarding calling in for drug testing? What's the procedure? Oh, you check, um, it, the checking starts um, 5 o'clock in the morning and you got to check in uh, 365 days. Um, and um, I've been, uh, I've gotten the loot in the beginning because, um, because I don't know how much water you can drink and um, I don't know if that's what I'm talking about. Let me ask you. In all the times, how many times would you estimate you have been tested since you've been in the Maxims program? Um, in the beginning, it was even up to um, eight times uh, a month, which it's $100 each time you get tested. But now it's uh, averaging about four after like three years. Have you ever, in all the time you've been tested by Maximus, had a positive finding? No, I never had negative. Okay. Um, with regards to the Maximus requirements, do they require group session counseling as well? Oh yeah, there's um, yeah, there's two support meetings. Uh, if, oh, you mean the two professional support meetings? Yes. Yeah, so, um, that uh, for about two years, I continued doing the two evenings a week for the meetings where we talk about you know just various things. And then just about six months ago, I got down to uh, uh, just once a week. And whose determination was it that you could go down to once a week? Well, my case manager, I guess, uh, Ann Morales, she says uh, it's the board's decision. Okay. Um, I don't think I have any other further questions, Your Honor. Okay, Mr. Steinheimer, anything further on recross? No, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions by the board? Sure. Congratulations on your sobriety. Thank you. Yes. So I, just, I do have a question. So did your husband, as a result of what happened to you in December of uh, 2013, that woke him up too? So it kind of that it just it cars just spoke? coincided uh, accidentally, sorta. Okay. Okay. I'm assuming that this was just an oversight, but um, on your application uh, or your petition for early termination. Here's question 14, which says, are you now on probation or parole for any criminal or administrative violations in this state or any other state? And you answered no, um, which is incorrect. Miss, is it, it lip or lippy? Lippy. There, she is not on any probation at, at the current time. She's on probation here. I, but I thought you referenced criminal probation. No, it says oh. probation or parole for any criminal or administrative violations. Oh. Well, that, yeah, she's so on probation. Here. I assume she just didn't understand that. Yeah. Is, is that right? Okay. Um, nothing else. Okay. Um, hi. Um, first of all, I thank you for coming here, and I want to thank you for your honesty because I don't I haven't seen anybody who start with a statement said yes I'm an alcoholic. Most people, they they don't admit they're an alcoholic, and they first outright and say you're alcoholic. So then let's start with that alcoholic thing. When did it start? Did it start when you were in high school, college, or? 
How, how do you start? You start with your husband together? I mean, let's, tell, let's tell the history here. How much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> we got a whole day here. <laughs> well, well um, I, I was a late starter, 20-some. Um, I wanted to party, but I was just a nerd. Nobody was around me to party together. Uh, pharmacy school, uh, my husband and I we had graduated, even though he doesn't have a California license. He was a party king, and uh, I think he kept continuing to party, whereas I became mom, and I kind of stopped drinking. And then as his disease got just worse and worse, I think that my resentments and my anger, I had to have a crutch, and I didn't have God at the time. So I had to hold on to something, and that was my alcohol at the time. Okay, so it's something like you are not aware of, and pretty soon you keep drinking, keep drinking, and then you realize that you have a problem. I, I drink mostly beer at home after I got home because basically I sent my husband back home to Hawaii, and I was basically a single mother for several years. And two teenage girls, a year and a half apart, they are miserable. They fought every single day, and long day of work, came home, I had my beer, because I couldn't handle their fighting every single day. So that's my excuse, but that's how it started. Okay. And you mentioned that a, the Maximus program is kind of expensive, so could you tell the board the, how, how much it costs? Um, in the, uh, right now, there's a $100 monthly fee. For testing. No, that's Maximus fee. Oh. And testing, um, just what um, Maximus charges and the, the lab charges together, it's $100 a, a pop. Um, it could be four to five times. Once in a while, they'll do the blood test on you. Um, that runs about $250. Um, and also the, um, the support meeting, uh, up until recently, I was doing two, uh, Two weekly, and that was 250, and now it's down to 150. So that's when I, what I meant by 100, about thousand dollars a month. Okay. Now, we have some students in the audience. Now, I want you to tell what advice you're gonna tell them right now. I want you to say it right on the record. Here. This is what I learned. From the ethics class I, I took, for, uh, let me start with this. All the years I thought, you know, what I do outside of my job is my business. So what I, uh, even when I got that first uh, ticket, I thought, you know, what, what is it their business? I'm fine at work. I never, and the, one of the letter from my last boss, she mentions that I was never late to work. I was never under the influence. But I was told from the ethics class, what well, I am expected to a higher uh, ethical standard. And supposedly, 20 some years ago when I graduated, I'm sure I learned that in the class. I don't remember. But the standard that is put on me was higher all along. I did not know that. And so you got to watch yourself and any legal matters, it's going to affect your license. That's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I got a comment. Right. Yeah, that, that is one of the reasons we're having the uh, meeting here. So uh, we have all the students uh, come to attend and listen to it. Unfortunately, we have a closed meeting earlier today, it's uh, longer than expected. Otherwise, we will have a lot more students here to listen to you on that. Because I keep, we have a lot of disciplinary cases on DUI. Um, and when we keep telling the licensees, say, do not get DUI, do not get DUI, it doesn't sing into their head until they hear somebody like you, what they have to go through, what kind of problem you have to go through then they might see things a little differently. That's one of the reasons we're here. So hopefully you're a good example for them to learn. Thank you. Well, you've already been congratulated for your sobriety and for, thank for being here. Thank you. I'm gonna say congratulations on the success of your daughters. That's spectacular, okay. good for you. Thank you.
And I just want to say, uh, I, I truly appreciate what your message is to the students. Thank you. All right, uh, so with that, um, if uh, I'll uh, allow the parties to make um, closing uh, arguments if they wish. Uh, Mr. Steinheimer, do you wish to make a closing? Um, I, I don't, but I do want to ask just one or two follow-up questions. Sure. Your Honor, for me. Um, Ms. Oyama, I just um, want to clarify something. I've been, it was told to me that uh, in your discussions with Maximus that there was a discussion of you being divorced from your husband. And I wouldn't want to know if that was just a um, misunderstanding on Maximus's part or if there or something uh, to that. But. I think when I started Maximus, I think it was at that point um, he was, we were separated. We were separated for about two years because I couldn't handle anymore. So with his alcohol problem. So I don't know if that's what they were talking about. Okay, that, that might clarify it. So thank you. Thank you. And, and with that, Your Honor, I have no further questions, and um, I submit at this time. Okay. Um, Mr. Zeiger, if, if you uh, wish, or excuse me, Mr. Zeigen. Um, <laughs> I'm you, used to them all here. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> no uh, worries. We're good. If uh, you'd like to make a uh, closing argument. You know, based upon all the panel's uh, comments, I, th I think I'm reading the panel appropriately. It seems to have been a long day for everybody here. And I would just echo all the sentiments that the various panel members made. I've been doing this a long time, and, and Ms. Oyama has earned every one of those accolades, and I'm very proud of where she is today. So we would submit on that basis. All right, so with that, uh, the record's closed, the matter's submitted, and as I mentioned earlier, um, after the second hearing, uh, our petition, the board will adjourn to closed session and then a decision will be issued at a later date. All right, um, and so with that, we'll let you um, pack up and then um, the parties for the second matter to come on up. Let's take a five minutes break before the next case begins. So, Your Honor, I think we're still waiting for uh, petitioner's counsel who... Oh, yes. Maybe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so we're uh, here on the record uh, before the board of uh, the California State Board of Pharmacy, and I noticed after the last hearing, one, one board member had to excuse himself. So in order to establish a quorum, uh, if I could have the board members identify themselves for the record, starting with the board member to my far right. Albert Wong, professional member. Maria Serpa, professional member. Debbie Veal, professional member. Greg Whippy, public member. Victor Law, the president, pub, uh, professional member. Levanza Butler, professional member. Ricardo Sanchez, public member. And the quorum has been established, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, so we will call the matter of the petition uh, for reinstatement of AO excuse me, ANO Specialty Pharmacy and David Smith. It's OAH number 2019-030-375. My name's Corin Wong. I'm an administrative law judge with the Office of Administrative Hearings. Uh, Mr. Steinheimer, if I could have you state your appearance for the record, please. 
Um, good afternoon, uh, Your Honor and Board Members. Andrew Steinheimer, Deputy Attorney General, appearing on behalf of the Attorney General, pursuant to Government Code Section 11522. And Dr. Park, if you would uh, state yourself, uh, state your name for the record and also um, identify who you have with you at the table. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Tony Park, attorney for petitioner ANO Pharmacy. And good afternoon, Your Honor. Andre Piscocho, representing um, Mr. Smith. And David Smith. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Smith, were you, uh, I think you were here before we started uh, the previous hearing when I discussed kind of procedurally how the matter would proceed? Yes. Okay, very good, so I, I won't repeat that. Um, so Mr. Steinheimer, if you would um, like to offer the packet and then provide your summary statement. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, I've provided uh, Your Honor with uh, what I'd like to have marked as Exhibit 1, which is the original petition packet with the accompanying documents. The board has also been provided a copy of the exhibit. Exhibit 1 generally consists of the petition for early termination of probation and petitioner's supporting documentation, which includes copies of the decision and orders in pharmacy case number 5077, uh, A&O pharmacy policies and procedures dated July 1st, 2018, copies of continuing education certificates, a certificate demonstrating completion of a pharmacy ethics course. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, letters of support uh, from various colleagues, uh, and that, I guess that's it. The certification of the ethics courses. Left over from my notes from the last one, so I apologize. No problem. Uh, so at this time, uh, it also concludes, Exhibit 1 also contains a certified copy of the decision and order in Board of Pharmacy case number 5077 pertaining to a and Specialty Pharmacy, which was effective May 20th, 2015, as well as a certified copy of the decision and order in Board of Pharmacy case number 5077 pertaining to David Mark Smith, which was also effective May 20th, 2015. And I ask that Exhibit 1 uh, be accepted into evidence at this time. Okay, the petition and supporting documents will be marked collectively as Exhibit 1. Uh, Dr. Park, any objection to one for all purposes? None, Your Honor. And one is so admitted. Uh, Mr. Steinheimer, uh, just since we have them already, do you mind if I mark um, petitioner's documents and take care of those at this time? Uh, not at all. Okay, and so Dr. Park, I want to make sure I have everything. I have two separate stacks. That's correct, Your Honor. Exhibit. Oh. Go ahead. Uh, Exhibit E as in Edward, um, it is a one-page document. Um, it is a one-page document dated December 6, 2018 from Med Impact, uh, communication directly to the pharmacy and notifying the pharmacy of its provider network termination. Okay, and that document will be marked as Exhibit E uh, for identification. Mr. Steinheimer, any objection to E for all purposes? No objection. E is so admitted. And Dr. Park, the next document. Exhibit F as in Frank is um, a series of four pages of subsequent communications after the network termination notice was uh, sent to the pharmacy uh, to try to accommodate for the patient population that has come to rely on the sterile compounding pharmacy um, uh, and the, the, the discussions pertain, pertaining to that issue. Right. The, those documents will be marked collectively as Exhibit F. Mr. Steinheimer, any objection to F for all purposes? Uh, no objection. F is so admitted. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Steinheimer. And if you'd like to provide your summary. Uh, yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, on or about March 10th, 2006, the Board of Pharmacy uh, issued license number uh, PHY 47448 to petitioner a and Specialty Pharmacy. On about August 2nd, 2006, the board issued sterile compounding license number LSC99382 to Smith Riker Pharmacy Inc. to do business as A&O Specialty Pharmacy. And on or about November 3rd, 1981, the board issued pharmacist license number RPH36789 to petitioner David Mark Smith. On August 8, 2014, an accusation was filed against the petitioners in case number 5077. The accusation alleged that petitioners were subject to discipline on numerous grounds, including uh, one, exceeding the allowable pharmacist to technician ratio, 
to receiving deliveries of dangerous drugs, which were signed for by a non-pharmacist. Three, failing to quarantine batch-produced sterile injectable drugs for end product testing. Four, the use of compounded stock ingredients beyond their be past their beyond use dates. Five, compounding drug products with beyond use dates exceeding 180 days. Six, failing to maintain accurate lot numbers for the records of compounded drug products. Seven, failing to disinfect on a weekly basis the clean room where sterile injectable drugs were compounded. Eight, dispensing misbranded products. And related to that, nine, the fraudulent billing for the misbranded products. Petitioners and the board agreed to a stipulated settlement effective May 20th, 2015. Pursuant to the stipulated settlement, the petitioner's licenses were revoked, but the revocation was stayed and petitioners were placed on probation for a period of five years. Additionally, petitioner Smith was suspended for a period of 30 days and petitioners were jointly required to pay $12,988.50 to the board to cover the cost of investigation and prosecution. Petitioners have complied with all the terms of the probation so far and have paid the cost in full. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Park, do you wish to provide an opening statement? Um, <clears throat> Your Honor, um, the way that we'd like to, to uh, present our uh, petition would be to have uh, my colleague, uh, Mr. Andre, and Andre Biscocho, provide the opening, uh, and then have Mr. Smith uh, provide uh, supplemental uh, um, discussion points uh, for the purpose of clarifying uh, some of the causes for discipline in the prior accusation, um, and then I will provide the closing thereafter. Very good. Mr. Viscocho? Yes, that's correct, Your Honor. Honorable Judge and the members of the board, um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity to present the petitions uh, for early termination of probation on behalf of A&O Specialty Pharmacy and Mr. David Mark Smith. Um, on or about May 6, 2015, the board adopted the stipulated uh, settlement agreement uh, order in case number 5077 entitled in the matter of the accusation against a and Specialty Pharmacy, David Mark Smith, and Akira A. Oyama. The order revoked Mr. Smith's pharmacist license RPH 36789, pharmacy permit PHY 47448, and sterile compounding license LSC 99382. But the revocation was stayed and the respective licenses were placed on probation for five years, effective May 20th, 2015. Uh, Mr. Smith and A&O Specialty Pharmacy are very grateful to the board for giving them opportunity to demonstrate their rehabilitation and commitment to public safety and to the profession of pharmacy under the terms of the probation. And we recognize the board's mandate of public protection. And we acknowledge the fact that petitions for early termination of probation are sparingly granted. The purpose of this petition hearing is not to relitigate the merits of the case and the underlying causes of the discipline imposed upon Mr. Smith and the A&O Specialty Pharmacy, but we believe that exceptional circumstances of our client's case warrant the early termination of their respective probations for the following reasons. One, Mr. Smith and the A&O Specialty Pharmacy have fully corrected and remediated the errors set forth in the accusation. Mr. Smith will testify, testify about the details of his remediation efforts, particularly about his continued provision of constant and methodical approach to process improvement and implementation of innovative practices that are above and beyond mere regulatory compliance. That Mr. Smith and they and no specialty pharmacy always have the safety and welfare of their patients as their top priority and that Mr. Smith undergoes regular and continuous training and enhancements of pharmacy processes. Two, Mr. Smith has strong professional community support and he enjoys a reputation of honest, dedicated, and extremely knowledgeable healthcare professional. Three, Mr. Smith and ANO Specialty Pharmacy have been actively involved in various community outreach programs and charitable works such as a sponsorship and participation in free vaccination for the homeless, supporting and holding fundraising events for the community, such as ending polio in the world and several youth development programs. 
and Mr. Smith will testify uh, about the details of his community involvement. Four, there has been a considerable passage of time because the violations that in this case occurred more than five years ago. And five, um, Mr. Smith and the ANO Specialty Pharmacy um, experienced um, extreme hardship because of the probation. Uh, particularly, ANO Specialty Pharmacy was terminated from Med Impact Network uh, effective January 21st, 2019 as stated in Med Impact's notice letter dated December 6, 2018, uh, because of the pharmacy's uh, probationary status, which unfortunately is a violation of their contractual terms, uh, which is in Exhibit, exhibit E. Uh, in addition to that, um, Central, Coast, Central Coast Alliance for Health uh, has also initiated the transfer of all compound prescriptions for its members uh, out of uh, ANO Specialty Pharmacy because this Med Impact contract has been terminated. Uh, while we understand that such results may be of little or no concern to the board, we respectfully ask for consideration of the continuous adverse impact of these actions on our client's ability to effectively serve their patients in light of the clear evidence of rehabilitation presented with this petition. And Mr. Smith will present facts and information regarding his more than 25 years of safe and responsible practice that all issues in the accusation have been completely rectified, that no harm resulted from their infractions, that there is clear and unequivocal evidence of full rehabilitation. Uh, Mr. Smith and ANO Specialty Pharmacy are deeply remorseful about the circumstances that led to the proceedings in this case, um, but the early termination of probation case uh, on their behalf posed no risk to the public, and uh, this early termination probation is in fact in the public interest. And I'll, I'll be asking um, Mr. Smith uh, some questions uh, so we can, he can explain um, some of the information um, contained in the petition. Okay, so Mr. Smith, uh, <clears throat> if I could have you stand and raise your right hand, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you will provide in this matter will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, please have a seat. And if you would state and spell your name for the record, please. David Smith, S-M-I-T-H. Okay, Mr. Viscoso, whenever you're ready. All right. Uh, Mr. Smith, uh, can you please tell us, uh, tell the board a little about yourself professionally? Hello, I'm David Smith, and I, I graduated from the University of Pacific in 1981. And now I'm going on my 37 years of service in the profession of pharmacy. I uh, began work with Long's Drug Stores for 15 years, 10 years as a staff pharmacist, and five years as a, as a manager, pharmacy manager. I moved on to uh, medical clinic pharmacy in Santa Cruz, uh, an independent pharmacy. We, were, we worked hospice and uh, worked also as contractor for Cedar Maternity and Surgery Center. Then I wanted to buy my own pharmacy. And in 2003, I bought a and Clinic Pharmacy in Salinas. And, in, and then in 2006, we opened a and Specialty Pharmacy, which was uh, just down the street, but I wanted to specialize in non-sterile and sterile compounding. Um, all right, Mr. Smith, um, what have you learned from the accusation in the subsequent probation as it relates to pharmacy operations in general and particularly in compounding practice? Well, I'm keenly aware of the laws and regulations that govern our, our uh, professional pharmacy, and I realize the adverse effects that I could have <coughs> caused uh, our public and the safety and uh, that could have been caused from our mistakes. And what have you been doing uh, differently since the accusation and the probation uh, in relation to uh, the following violations? Um, in the first and 11 causes for discipline, the board found you and the pharmacy to have exceeded the allowable pharmacist to technician ratio, and that during a routine inspection, there were observed three technicians while there's only one pharmacist on duty. Yeah, this, this violation uh, was under my supervision 
of, of the pharmacy operations, and um, I've since corrected this. Uh, there's been no further incident upon any board inspections, and we've also followed up with a revised policy and procedure on our pharmacy staffing, which is uh, Exhibit B, uh, SOP 2.08. In the second and twelfth causes for discipline, the board found you and the pharmacy that non-pharmacists received and signed for deliveries of dangerous drugs or controlled substances in the pharmacy. Uh, yes, this is correct. Uh, but the sole reason why the pharmacist did not pers personally sign for and receive these sporadic controlled substances orders was to preserve the integrity of the sterile working environment. In those instances, we made the professional judgment uh, that the patient's safety was enhanced by remaining within the sterile environment and while compounding sterile preparations and, and the check and the completion of these sterile compounding work rather than interrupting our workflow and breaking the sterile integrity of the work environment. But now we understand the implications of our past actions and the negative consequences that we resulted from our errors. We regret our lapse in professional judgment and have given rise to the proceedings in our case. Uh, we have since corrected these mistakes and all drug deliveries are now signed, all manifests are signed by the pharmacists in the pharmacy area when we receive all drugs. And with that, we have a, our drug procurement receipt and inspection, which is our SOP 6.01 that we uh, live by in our pharmacy. Mr. Smith, what happens if a pharmacist working inside a sterile, if the pharmacy is working inside a sterile compounding room and the delivery comes in? And if that is the case, uh, that shipment will not be signed for and we'll have to come back at a later date. Thank you. In the third and 13 causes for discipline, the Board of Pharmacy have found you and the pharmacy to have failed to quarantine, batch, produce sterile injectable drugs for end product testing. Uh, we sincerely regret uh, this inadvertent in ensuring quality in our uh, preparations. And we have remediated this issue by performing degradation and stability studies on our preparations which include endotoxin testing, sterility, and potency. And that's ex ex Exhibit B, uh, our SOP 9.051. And we've also amended the pharmacy policies and procedures for beyond use datings for compounded preparations, which is our SOP 9.05. And this lays out a step-by-step -step, um, process for completing this. All right, in the fourth and 14 causes for discipline, um, the board have found you in the pharmacy to have used ingredients past their beyond use dates to prepare compounded drug products. And we have since mended this issue, and to date we have had no further incidences and observed in subsequent uh, inspections by the state board. Um, we have also amended our policy and procedures to accurately depict our current operations, which is Exhibit B, SOP 9.05. And in the fifth and 15 causes for discipline, the Board of Pharmacy have found you and the pharmacy to have compounded drug products with beyond use dates exceeding 180 days in that compounded drug products were discovered with assigned and labeled uh, beyond use dates over 180 days in the active inventory. And this was immediately <coughs> rectified upon inspection and we have strictly adhered to the regulatory requirements in determining and assigning beyond use dates to our compounded drug products. All, amendment, all amendments in our operations relating to this issue we have memorialized in a revised policy and procedure uh, exhibit B, SOP 9.05, uh, which we follow for all non-sterile compounded drug preparations. And Mr. Smith, in the sixth and sixteen causes for discipline, the board have found you and the pharmacy to have failed to maintain accurate lot numbers of records of compounded drug products. 
uh, all master formulas and subformulas, which include acids, bases, and um, preservatives, are now made and destroyed upon completion. Uh, to this date, we have no further incidents of uh, observed in the pharmacy by state board inspectors. And we have amended our pharmacy policy and procedures to accurately depict our current operations, which is Exhibit B, SOP 9.052. And in the seventh and 17th causes for discipline, the board have found you and the pharmacy to have failed to disinfect the clean room on a weekly basis and that a review of the cleaning log during an inspection in, um, conducted at the wall, ceiling, and storage units in the clean room where sterile injectable drug products were compounded were not disinfected weekly. And we've updated our pharmacy policies and procedures to the current regulations for cleaning and maintenance of the clean room facility, um, and particularly the requirement for cleaning walls, ceilings, tables, stools, and all other items in the ISO class 7 and ISO class 8 environment at least once monthly. In the 8th and 18th causes for discipline as they relate to the 9th and 19th causes for discipline at the board, uh, pharmacy has found you in the pharmacy uh, to have, uh, have been compounding and dispensing different strengths of hydroxycobalamin injection products, but uh, were labeled as being made by a commercial drug manufacturer. Um, and there are some billing discrepancies uh, absurd. And admittedly, we assigned NDCs for the, some of the sterile compounded hydroxy progesterone injections. And we, only did, and we only did this for our indigent pediatric patients enrolled in the California Children's Services to receive their medications that were either commercially unavailable or in short supply. In spite of my earnest intentions, we've realized that our actions are inappropriate and we immediately ceased that erroneous billing practice and we have completely detached ourselves from any such activity since that incident. All right, Mr. Smith, uh, do you undergo any regular compounding trainings? Uh, I do. My last training was uh, the uh, analytical research uh, quality summit, and that was in um, Oklahoma City in September. And how many CE units have you completed uh, from August 2016 to about August 2018? And I've completed 70 units of CE credit. Mr. Smith, what process or operational improvements have you implemented in the pharmacy? Well, I'll start out with leadership. And uh, my daughter, Serena, is a pharmacist. And she and I have worked closely uh, with our staff to constantly improve the compounds we produce for our patients. Uh, she took over the post of PIC in April of 2015. And with her help, we're able to grow and provide specialized sterile and non-sterile preparations for our patients. And uh, she's been quite a leader in that effort. Uh, we've also worked with Eagle Analytical Laboratories. And at this time, uh, we've done double bracketed uh, stability studies, stability and degradation studies for uh, Trimix. We've done the same stability and degradation studies for methylcobalamin, 25 milligrams, sodium phenylbutyrate, 200 milligrams, and two veterinary eye drops, uh, cyclosporin, 2%, and also tacrolimus, 0.3%. Okay, uh, Mr. Viscoso, I noticed that um, Dr. Smith is just going through his narrative statement. Um, I want to remind you that the board members and I have received the statement okay. in advance of today, and we've reviewed it, so okay. it's really not necessary to repeat it. So okay. um, if there's things you would like to highlight or if there's other things not covered, then that probably is where you want to focus on your attention. Um, Mr. Smith, are you part of any professional organizations? 
Uh, I am. I'm a member of uh, CPHA. Um, I was on the Board of Trustees uh, and also District uh, Trustee during uh, Ralph Saroyan and Deborah Johnson's uh, presidency. I'm also a fellow with uh, um, the IACP, International Academy of Compounding. Um, I've been on the advisory board for PCCA, um, the advisory board for prescribed wellness, and I'm also a member of uh, NCPA, National Community Pharmacists Association, and I'm a member of the uh, P&T Committee for our local managed Medicare, which is Central Coast Alliance for Health. Regarding your community involvement, are you a member of any civic or community organizations? Yeah, I'm, a, uh, I'm in the downtown Rotary in Salinas. And and can you tell us uh, something about what this organization does? Well, uh, the, the Rotary, we do quite a bit for, the, for cities all over the world. And um, anyway, it's a volunteer organization, service above self. And um, just to give you a quick, I, we, I head up, I help head up the, our uh, local annual vaccination down at Dorothy's Kitchen in the old Chinatown in Salinas. And uh, we vaccinate the homeless people uh, yearly at Thanksgiving time. All right, Mr. Smith, thank you. Uh, Mr. Smith, um, who is Mr. William Stewart to you? Uh, Mr. M William Stewart is, uh, is a, a colleague and friend of mine. I met him through, uh, he's a neighbor of my brother's, and my, my daughter Serena, did a, she went to USC and did an internship with William, and since then we've become good colleagues, and I've almost come to, to know that if it's good for William, it's good for me. And I followed that mantra, and I know many of you know William, and what William's done, I followed. He did smoke studies in his clean room. I did that. I did smoke studies in my clean room. He started wearing sterile gowns. I started wearing sterile gowns. And so it's that kind of colleague, you know, I went out and got an air impaction to do my own quality air sampling. I, I put in a, 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 I bought a new, convection oven. I mean, it's everything that, that, um, that, that just raises the roof on your quality and your, um, and putting out products that are safe. All right, Mr. Smith, who is Mr. Peter Koshland? Uh, Peter is a friend of mine and colleague. Uh, I've known him for 12 years. And uh, he and I, um, well, we've been in many associations together, but we're in a networking group, we're in our concierge group, uh, where we share best practices. And uh, also, he was on the advisory council with PCCA, and I, he and I worked together on that. And who is Mr. Dana Gordon to you, Mr. Smith? Uh, Dana's my oldest friend of pharmacy, and he's a pharmacy owner in Pacific Grove, he has Central Avenue Pharmacy, and and uh, uh, Dana and I worked early on, but he's, um, he's definitely a, a real profession and somebody you can look up to. He's probably one of the reasons I'm a, I'm a pharmacy business owner is because of Dana. And who is Mr. Robert Brenzel? Yeah, Bob Brenzel is also another colleague from Walnut Creek. He and I, we've met at, at IACP together in Washington and always go to the Hill just to advocate, you know, uh, patient access to compounded medications and, and uh, these guys have all become definitely friends and colleagues of mine. All right, thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Smith, did you encounter any other challenges as a result of your probation and that of the pharmacy? So my challenge now, and the reason I'm here, is that Med, yes, Med Impact informed us and sent us a letter that uh, A&O Specialty Compounding will be terminated from its contract 
because of uh, network uh, contractual agreement, uh, because of my probationary status, and it apparently is a violation of the, of the contract agreement. And what, is there another, um, is there another organization that um, has um, notified you that they'll be um, terminating you from their network as a result of this med impact termination? Yeah, and additionally, Central Coast Alliance for Health, that's our man managed Medi-Cal, is uh, f informed me that all their patients, which, which are the, uh, the same, the CCS patients that are now on managed Medica Medicaid in our local managed Medicare, um, they're all to be, their compounded medications will now be transferred out from our local pharmacy out to Walgreens in Palo Alto. Can I just, yeah. I'd like to just say a couple things and let you know a little bit about Salinas, but these children that I take care of, that uh, these children are poor, indigent, um, whose health insurance and drug benefits are covered by the Medi-Cal managed care program. Uh, those are the children that uh, Mr. Smith is referring to that re that require sterile compounding services. Sorry about that. You know, when you drive out to Fernanda's house and she's this little six-year-old girl and her and her mom and dad and two other sisters are living in a two-bedroom house out in Watsonville. And uh, I take their medicines out there on my way home. I live in Santa Cruz, so I drive by and I, I drop them out there. And uh, those, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of funny. I mean, it's just... Uh, here I am, a white guy from Santa Cruz, and I go down and buy a pharmacy in a Mexican town. But those are my people. And my staff, 70% of them speak Spanish. I can't hire somebody if they don't speak Spanish. So it's these people. It's, it's the Yanez family, the Cabrillos, that I got in trouble making hydroxocobalamine for. And, I, and these, these are big kids now, and I'm still helping them. They go to Stanford to the genetic clinic, and they all have deficiencies and nutritional deficiencies, and they need this hydroxycobalamin. Now I make it at a 20 milligram strength. And, um, you know, it's, it's the idea that um, I've worked directly with Central Coast Alliance, and because MedImpact has, you know, has stop my contract, I, um, I, I can't, you know, I, I can't take care of these people. And these are, these are my kids, you know. These are 30 people that live in my community that we deliver to at their homes. And so it, 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 it comes from the heart, you know. I get 14 more months, I'd be done with this thing. You know, my probation's over. I've, I've, I'm, uh, I've, I, I would willing to sell my, to, to spend my time, but definitely I don't want to lose these people. This is important to us. Mr. Smith, could you um, refer to Exhibit E um, and look at that letter? Uh, could you identify uh, what this letter represents to you? Yeah, so this is the letter from Med Impact stating that our, our contract would be uh, discontinued at the, um, yeah, January 21st of 2019. And so when you first saw this letter, uh, what was the first thing that came to your mind? <laughs> well, I mean, immediately was, you know, the loss of, of uh, you know, compounding these children's medications. Could you refer to exhibit F as in Frank? This appears to be a series of email communications between you and some other representative. Who is that representative that you were emailing with? Well, there's a number of people on here. I, I, I originally, just so you know, I, I, um, PBMs are very difficult to deal with. I actually went out to the managed Medi-Cal and, and we, we sat down with the medical director, the pharmacy director, and the COO, and we came up with a, a, uh, a, um, a contract 
to, to bypass Med Impact. But apparently, Med Impact had something to do with that because now we, we can no longer, um, well, they're gonna, they're gonna send our, our business to, Wal to uh, Walgreens in Palo Alto, but I'm, I'm, I don't know Miriam, but I know many of people, Michelle and Angelique and, and, and the pharmacy directors, Michael Blatt. So the Central Coast Alliance is a, is a what? A, a, a county Medi-Cal managed program, yes? Yes, that's correct. And they have apparently farmed out the PBM uh, to the MedImpact people, all of the drug benefits, is that correct? That's correct. So you received the letter from MedImpact saying that you're out because of, wh why were you kicked out of the MedImpact? Can you, can you read that in Exhibit E? Sorry, again, we're flipping back oh. and forth. If you go back to Exhibit E, why exactly did, are they stating the reason for you getting kicked out of the provider network? Read. Okay. So I think it's the second, uh, is that the second sentence of that first main body of paragraph? Oh, it's come to our attention that the California State Board of Pharmacy has taken disciplinary action against the pharmacy, and as a result of such action, the pharmacy license is on probation. Such disciplinary action constitutes a violation of the agreement and grounds for termination under the agreement and the, and the, and the Medicare, Medicare Pharmacy Network Policy and Procedures Manual. So you received that notice in when? January sometime? Yeah, I, well, it came uh, on uh, December 6 of 2018. And subsequent to that, you went to directly to, kind of you went over MedImpact's head, sounds like, to the Central Alliance people, correct? And that's when you entered into some sort of direct agreement, was it? Yeah, that's correct, yes. So surely they knew that you got this MedImpact notice, yeah. correct? Correct, yes. And, and so what were you able to negotiate directly with the Central Alliance people? Well, even before this, we were, we were going outside Med Impact. I mean, with a direct contract working through last year. So this just totally came as a surprise, I mean. To Do you take the fact that they were willing to negotiate directly with you despite the, the Med Impact termination notice as some measure of confidence in your ability? Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. How many lives do you take care of within that are within the? Um, uh, I take care of thirty lives, and are they all pediatric? Well, adults within this, yes, they're all pediatric, and then we've we've always been on board to do any emergency eye drops for them if they need any fortified eye drops, um, but most most of it is just pediatric compounding. Um, what's the what's the fiscal hit on your pharmacy by by virtue of being kicked out of the Med Impact Network? Is it is it cataclysmic? Is no, it it's not. The road? It's not. It's about pride. It's what I am. It's a pharmacist. It's about caring for patients. Nothing further, Your Honor. Cross examination. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Smith. Can you tell me how many pharmacists work uh, with you? Yes, we have uh, two to two and a half. Yes, we have uh, Serena, my daughter, myself, and Jesse Quinones. Okay, and then currently how many pharmacy techs do you have? We have three pharmacy techs working in the lab. Okay, and um, who now is responsible for training the pharmacists and the pharmacy techs? Yes, my, my daughter is in charge of that, yes. Um, okay. Um, with respect to um, Exhibit B, which is part of Exhibit 1 that we've introduced, it's your new policies and procedures, correct? Correct, yes. Um, who came up with and developed those new policies and procedures? Oh, my daughter, Serena. Okay. And do you know how, how she went about that in terms of, of making these changes to your policies or updating them? Yeah, she went to, well, I mean, part of her training was she went to critical point in, um, back in New Jersey when she first came on board. In fact, she's going back there to a critical point um, in next month, April 16th, for a retraining. Oh, thank you. Um, okay. Um, one of the things that your um, counsel said during the uh, initial statement was that the, this is posing an extreme hardship on your um, pharmacy, but it sounds to me like the extreme hardship that he was actually describing is on some of your patients. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, I just wanted to clarify yeah, that. Yeah, it's not, no. I'm, 
it, yes, it's patient care. Okay, and that's what we just what you just discussed with Correct. the indigent patients. Yes. Okay. Um, one of the things that um, I just had a question about uh, the pestle pharmacy compliance system is something that's been identified as a procedure or um, something that you've implemented to help comply with some of the deficiencies. Can you explain what that is? Yes. Yeah, so pestle is a. It's, it's, it's just a compliance tool that helps you uh, monitor uh, your temperatures within the lab, uh, cleaning, daily cleaning, monthly cleaning. It helps you uh, with the, your uh, training, so you record training, your biannual uh, 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 media fills that you need to do. You can also have, uh, you know, your biannual Cleaning, or, or excuse me, air, air testing by, we use a company called TSS. And, and then it also gives you reminders for pharmacy policy and procedures. Okay. Um, you submitted a number of letters of support and uh, your counsel asked you about who the authors were. Um, I have a question with respect to the drafting of those letters. It, it appears to me that a lot of them have very similar language. Did you know if you provided a, a template for your um, colleagues to use when providing a letter of support, or maybe your counsel did, or where that, that language came from? I'm not aware of that. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions I have. All right, Dr. Park or Mr. Viscoso, anything further on redirect? No, nothing further, Your Honor. Okay, are there any questions by the board? I just want to say thank you for, for coming and giving uh, your side of the, the story. Um, I was a state investigator in Salinas, right off of Laurel Drive, and. I covered four counties out there for many years, so I can relate to what you were saying out there. Thank you. Thank you. I got it. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for coming here today. Um, just want to ask you. One question is, you said you have two and a half pharmacists, but then during delivery time, you say you have to stop the, an operation uh, so you could sign off on the, uh, the order. Now you have what, two and a half pharmacists, that should, you, you don't do all the compounding at the same time though, do you? No, at, at, the, at the time of the, accu of the accusation, there was me. Oh, that was just you? Yes. Oh, okay, now yeah, you have two I was, and a half. Oh, yeah, I was oh. growing my business, and, and, and yes, I exactly. See. All right, and then prior to owning your own pharmacy, did you have any education on doing sterile compounding? Yes, I, I was, well, I was trained on the job uh, doing, uh, working with hospice and in my former job with the medical clinic pharmacy, and, and I had, at that time, I had learned uh, some sterile technique, uh, working on call at the uh, Sutter Maternity and Surgery Center in Santa Cruz. But apparently those training were not sufficient. No, well th then I was trained at PCCA. I took courses for non-sterile compounding. That's, that's yeah, after. excuse me. Yeah, after. That's after. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so now, yeah. You, you, now you think you are a, a capable and competent sterile compounding pharmacist, right? Yes, Is that sir. a correct statement? Yes, that's correct. All right, thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, I have a question, and it probably relates to what Victor just stated. Um, it's clear that you've corrected everything, and thank you for doing that. But it also is clear that, I mean, this, it was a real mess before. Uh, how did that happen? Well, I was, I was, I was the one compounding, okay? 
a lot of things, I know there's a lot of, I, if you came in the pharmacy, I wasn't making, I wasn't, there was a lot of out of date product uh, chemicals on the shelf. Uh, I wasn't using those. I mean, there was a lot of housekeeping that needed to be done that I wasn't doing. Um, in those days, there was too much anticipatory compounding, too much stuff made. Now we don't do that. We make a prescription, and and if and if there's any, that's because we have some type of uh, high use for any one compound. But back then, we just we we made more than we needed to do, and that was what 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 we did. Um, yeah, I was, um, you know, I, I was, um, I was the one compounding, though. Okay, so, but now, as you state, everything's corrected. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I mean, it's two different worlds that that we were in back then. Was two thousand, and there was a well, it's a long in this compounding world. If you saw, I mean. Today, compared to then, it's, we're light years ahead. We, you should see what we wear now. It's incredible. We, we just wear the GNP outfits and, and we clean with all the right agents and we do all the right things. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Good, thank you. Uh, and I guess kind of to go off what he was saying, uh, what Mr. Lippi was saying is the reason you didn't do all the right things in the past. Was it just lack of education? You know, not, not testing for sterility and that kind of stuff? Was that just you didn't know or? Yes. I mean, basically, it, w it was, it wasn't trying to break the law. It was just that, that there was, like, California state law was always different than USP law. Yeah. Okay. Hopefully we're fixing that. <laughs> and and I'd say that was basically it. Uh, there was USP, and there's we've always been more strict. And it took me a long time to get that in my noggin. <laughs> okay, but it's there. I, I I'm just surprised when you said that you you actually worked at Sutter because I would think that they would have had it right. And so going from there to your own pharmacy, you would have carried some of that training with you. But that was back in 2011. Yeah, I don't, I mean. I, and I guess my only worry is, and I, I mean, you know, you had a very detailed statement, and then you took it, took us through it again, which probably next time we wouldn't need to do. Um, so I get it that you've been trained again, but I just want to make sure, it seems like you should have been trained then, and it didn't stick. I just want to make sure that you, you've been trained this time. It, I just want to make sure it really is sticking. I mean, you, you've written all the right things. But if it, and I, I, I don't mean to sound like a jerk, but if in, you're working in Sutter, which I would have thought that that was a pretty good place to work, and then you went to your own pharmacy, I don't know, did you cut corners? Did you not pay attention? And then, so that now you've been retrained, did it really stick this time? That, that's all I'm asking. It stuck. It stuck. And let me, may I just say, not to Sutter, I was a contracted pharmacist. I, I, you know, I wasn't under Sutter, but, but just working for an independent pharmacy. Oh, okay, you weren't in there. No, facility. no, okay. no, okay. I'm sorry if okay. I misinformed you, but no. Okay, and the other thing is you're a PharmD. I think everyone should be calling you Dr. Smith and not Mr. Smith, but that's just oh. my thing. Hi, I have a, a, a couple of questions just to clarify, because uh, it, it did confuse me a little bit. In um, Exhibit B, which has been referenced several times in all the SOPs, and so it's just a point of clarification. Um, each of the SOPs have a different address on the top that is not in Salinas. So that threw me off for quite a while because I was looking at um, two different licensed pharmacies. I realized that you have two different licensed pharmacies, but they're both in Salinas. So the address that's on the other, on all the SOPs is a Stockton address. Where does that come from? I submitted SOPs 
and um, and then uh, my attorneys corrected my language on them so they would be properly uh, addressed and th that's what that is and then I've taken those SOPs and put them back into my SOPs. So the Exhibit B are your current SOPs that you perform and train to that's now? Cor that's correct. Um, because the other part is on the pharmacy staff attestation. Um, I, I think that's wonderful that you have a place for your, during your training and your annual evaluation that you have a place for the staff to sign off. But it references a different pharmacy also. It says Angor pharmacy policies. And so those two things had me confused because I did Google Angor pharmacy and it is in Stockton. So my assumption is that this were a template that you maybe borrowed from another pharmacy and that didn't get changed. Um, That's correct. I submitted SOPs and 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 uh, and then my attorneys um, corrected all my English and all that, mm -hmm. so that was proper. And I think it was on these forms. So these, I just want to be clear then. So these documents in Exhibit B are in force at the pharmacy in Salinas. And if, if we were to go and see them, we would see that these are part of your annual review and your staff have signed them. Is that what it implies that the staff have reviewed them? It's just a typographical thing that is left over from old template. I just wanted to make sure that's correct. I just want to make sure that these SOPs are what's currently being used and trained to at the pharmacy. Um, and what's left over on here are just errors from a template, but they're currently in force at your uh, practice. Well, that's correct, yes. Okay. Yes. I, and I just want to clarify, because on here it says a and Pharmacy on Pershing Avenue in Stockton. Right. But that's not your right, correct address. Well, even down further, it says the attestation, it says Angor Pharmacy. Okay. And Angor Pharmacy is in Stockton. Okay. Um, so between January 31st to now, how, how many patients you lose? Uh, did you lose quite a bit of patients? Well, they they will officially they've they officially will leave April 1st. Oh, okay. So uh, I, I mean, if yeah. if you continue on probation, yeah, if, if but but if your probation is lifted, then you will be continue uh, without. Yeah, then I can continue uh, care. Uh, without yes. any, uh, lo lose uh, any patient, right? That's correct. Yes. Okay, that's all I got. Thanks. All right. Um, so, um, Dr. Park, do you have any further evidence you wish to offer? None, Your Honor. Okay. Um, Mr. Steinheimer, do you wish to give a closing argument? Uh, no, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. I submit. Uh, Dr. Park, your closing argument. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you again for the members of the board for this uh, very long day. Um, appreciate your patience. Um, I think Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith, has proven himself uh, to be a passionate, com compassionate, and caring pharmacist that really is motivated by really one thing, and that is the care of his patients that he has, for better or for worse, personalized into his life and he treats them like his own kids. And he didn't have to come here today. He certainly didn't have to hire two attorneys to basically represent him today. But he did it because he wants to be able to continue caring for the kids that he considers his own kids. The reason, the only reason, the, the pressing thing that's causing him to come here today is the fact that MedImpact is threatening his ability to care for his kids. And if it weren't for that, he would just write out the rest of his probation term, no problem, and be done wash his hands clean, and move on with the rest of his professional career. But the fact remains that there is this real and impending threat of his ability to take care of his kids, and that's why we need your help today. He has demonstrated remediation. He has demonstrated uh, earnest, uh, I believe, sincerity. And I think um, it now is up to you guys to decide whether or not you want to allow him to continue caring for his kids. Nothing further, Your Honor. 
All right, thank you. So the record's closed, the matter's submitted, and we can go off the record. All right, uh, so that concludes the hearing. Um, as I mentioned um, earlier, uh, the board will meet in closed session to decide the two petition uh, matters shortly. Um, so there won't be a decision issued today. Rather, there'll be a written decision uh, issued later in the future. All right, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back to you, Mr. President. Okay, let's take a five minutes break before the next case. No, you have, you have another case. Have another case? Two, one more case. Yeah, one more case. Three cases. Oh, oh, that's it. Oh, they and I did together. Oh, okay. That case we could go into closed session and deliberation. <laughs>